founder and CEO of Benetech, a, si a Silicon Valley nonprofit technology company that develops software applications to address unmet needs of users in the social sector. He is the recipient of numerous awards recognizing his work as a pioneering social entrepreneur, including the MacArthur Fellowship, Caltech Distinguished Alumni Award, the Skull Award for Social Entrepreneurship, and the Migo Medal, the highest honor in the blindness field from the American Foundation for the Blind. Benetech's work has grown to touch thousands of organizations in the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. Benetech's suite of tools and services have transformed the ways in which people with disabilities access printed information. At-risk human rights defenders safely document abuse, and environmental practitioners succeed in their efforts to protect species and ecosystems. Through his work with Benetech and as a trailblazer in the field of social entrepreneurship, Jim continues to advance his vision in a of a world in which the benefits of technology reach all of humanity, not just the wealthiest and most able 5%. It is our honor to have Jim Fruchterman with us. Jim. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So can I wander in front of this? OK. All right. Good. Good. Because I'm a walker and a talker. So um, thank you very much. Uh, I want to take you back to my student days, because the germ of what I ended up doing is something I came up with when I was a junior at Caltech. Um, you can guess from the fact that I went to Caltech that I am a deep nerd. Uh, and I did get to Stanford. I'll come back to that in a second. But, uh, but uh, at Caltech, um, I don't know if you've ever had this feeling, but I was walking around. I was taking these classes from these Nobel Prize winners. I was in the musical with Richard Feynman. You know, it was an incredible experience. But I felt, relatively speaking, like pond scum, right? Because I knew that if you want to be a successful professor, which is probably what I thought I wanted to do, um, I had to come up with ideas, right? ideas for research, inventions, whatever it had to be. And I wasn't coming up with any good ideas. So I was really kind of disappointed about this. I was really doubting myself. I was able to do the coursework, but I realized that to be successful in these professions, whether it was engineering or science or being a faculty member, you had to do this. So I was in a class a lot like this. It's being, it was taught by a guy who's actually a professor here at Stanford, uh, Bert Hesselink. And it was uh, Modern Optics, uh, APH 153, Applied Physics 153. And what we were learning about was how to build optical systems. So telescopes, lenses, all sorts of cool technology. Uh, it was a grad course, but I was taking it as an undergrad because I was a real geeky guy. And I, I really loved everything to do with light. Lasers, all that kind of stuff really turned me on. And so we were in, well, I know. No, no, seriously, I, I was almost going to drop out as a freshman, and we had a a 20-inch telescope on the top of one of the buildings. And I actually looked through it, and I saw the rings of Saturn. And I went, like, this shit's actually real. <laughs> you know? those, those photons bounced off that ring. It got into my eye. Anyway, so kept me, at, kept me in school, right? Lasers, cool. So we're in this class, and we're learning how to make an optical pattern recognition system. So the idea is you're going to have an optical system that actually recognizes things in the real world. And because this was the 1970s, all the jobs in technology were pretty much working for the military industrial complex. So the example that Bert Hesslink was giving was what the military application of an optical pattern recognition system is. And it's building a smart bomb. So the idea is that you have a, a missile that has a camera in its nose. And inside the brain of the missile is a representation of the target. It might be an airfield, or a bridge, or a tank. And what you do is you fire the missile, and it goes around and kind of looks around the world you know, with its camera. And then it spots its target, and it zooms in, and it blows it up. <laughs> cool technology. I was, wow, this is cool. But I had to do a project for that class. And I went back to my dorm room wondering, is there a more socially beneficial application of this technology? And then I came up with what I thought was my only original idea, but it was probably my only good idea in college. Instead of recognizing tanks in the battlefield, could we use that same technology to recognize letters and words and read to blind people? So I was really excited, and I actually designed a system that night. And it had you know, spinning photo disks and a single photo transistor, because that was the state of the art in those days. And, uh, and so as, as the film disk went by, the letter that you wanted to recognize, it would actually light up the photo transistor and say, oh, that was a D, or whatever the letter was. So I went to my professor. Bert Hesselink, and I said, I've got a great idea. I've got a great invention. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you can, you can do that. As a matter of fact, the National Security Agency uses that technology right now to recognize 
uh, Soviet faxes so that when they were intercepting millions of Soviet faxes and when one went by that said nuclear weapon in Russian, they would route that to a human being to read it. So they're like, oh, cool. What do they cost? He said, uh, I think they're a few million dollars a piece. I'm like, oh, not, not very practical for a reading machine. But anyway, I kept that one idea sort of in my pocket because well, I came up with at least one idea. And it was actually sort of feasible, but not economically feasible right off the bat. So then I came to Stanford. And um, I was an engineering student. I lived in Chrome Mem. Um, I think there's a, is it uh, Stern that is next to Chrome Mem? So that's where I took my meals and all that sort of thing. And Amazingly enough, I and two other students started an entrepreneurship talk series in Chrome M dorm because we heard this thing called Silicon Valley was happening outside our doors. And uh, so we invited in. The first speaker was the founder of Chrome M Co, which was then a very successful computer company named for our dorm. Um, so always check out you know, the direct connection to people who were in your dorm and started companies. They're always good to be in touch with. Um, and then the second speaker was the president of a private rocket company. So kind of bringing back that, you know, that missile thing. And I, I kind of wanted to be an astronaut. So um, he came and he gave a talk about a private enterprise rocket company. And I thought this was the best talk I'd heard. And then he said, uh, well, you know, what, what, what are we going to do now that we're going to talk? He said, well, we get to have dinner with the speaker afterwards. <laughs> and so we went across and we fed him at Stern. Uh, so over that sumptuous meal, um, uh, we were talking, and then he asked me a question. He said, Jim, what's your favorite science fiction author? Well, this was a tough question for me because as a geek in high school, I read a science fiction book a day. Uh, it's much easier than getting a date. I went to an all boys high school. you know. So, so I had my science fiction. So I had a lot of choices. But out of all the choices, I said, ah, right now I'm reading a lot of Paul Anderson. So I said, Paul Anderson, bingo. I was hired. <laughs> that was the interview question for this company. And I'm like, whoa, that was easier than I expected. <laughs> he offered me a job. And I'm like, oh, OK. Uh, and he said, well, what's your favorite science fiction character by Paul Anderson? And because I wanted to be an astronaut, it was Ensign Flandry, the dashing starship pilot kind of James Bond type. Um, er, wrong answer. Uh, he was a libertarian entrepreneur. So of course, he was Nicholas Van Ryan, the libertarian you know, interstellar merchant. Uh, so anyway, long story short, I went and joined a private rocket company. And my boss was a recent um, almost PhD from Stanford who had answered both questions correctly. <laughs> His name was Dave Ross. So anyway, we joined a private rocket company. It was one of the very first private co rocket companies in the United States. It, the liberalization had just happened, so you could actually legally compete with NASA. And we built a rocket. I was the chief electrical engineer. I was 21. So you can tell how advanced the technology for this company probably was based on their hiring policies and my ripe set of experience building rockets. Um, but anyway, the moment of truth um, was that the rocket is on the test stand. And it's been loaded with about a quarter of its normal fuel. We're going to do a short engine test. And our business manager, who was a recent Stanford graduate, but who was from Texas, and this was done in Texas, so she's doing the countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, shit. <laughs> The rocket blew up on the launch pad. <laughs> and it kind of looked like it was sort of drop kicked and kind of went woo, woo. Anyway, it was kind of funny, kind of terrifying at the same time. Giant fireball. And so most people would go, you know, the rocket business, it's not so, it's not so good for us, you know? But I and my, my boss, Dave Ross, decided that we wanted to start our own rocket company. Because of course, when the rocket blew up, pretty much this company fell apart. So I came back from. Um, this, this test site back to my, the house I was renting with a couple other students in Palo Alto. Interestingly enough, I wasn't expected. And that summer, since I was away, they rented my room to another student and charged us both rent. It's very <laughs> clever. So I get home, and there's a party in the house being thrown by the guy who's living in my room <laughs> of the Stanford Savile Yards which is the Gilbert and Sullivan Light Opera Group here. So, so anyway, I, I come in. There's a party. There's a guy who's got all his stuff in my room. What am I going to do? Well, I'll, I'll join the party. So who do I meet? Um, I meet 
one of the women who turns out to be one of the first women partners at Wilson Sonsini, because back then we didn't have women partners, but she was a fresh Stanford Law School grad and she was an associate. And she said, so what did you do? And I said, well, we blew up a rocket. What are you gonna do next? We're gonna start our own rocket company. She said, I think Wilson Sonsini would love to you know, be your lawyer. Great. So she brings us in to see Larry Sonsini, who is the number one, even then, venture capital lawyer and we tell him our story about how we blew up this rocket and how we were going to raise $300 million to start our own rocket company. He was not impressed. <laughs> and so normally, he's supposed to tell you about the four venture capitalists he wants to introduce you to. Instead, I think the quote was, good luck, guys. Sounds like a crapshoot to me. <laughs> oh, darn. So anyway, we went out and we tried to raise that $300 million. And for some strange reason, nobody gave it to us. But Dave. My former boss, now my partner, said after about a year of, of trying to get this off the ground and failing, um, was uh, he had a friend who was an HP employee. And he was a chip designer there. And he had an idea for starting a company. So we went to a restaurant in El Camino. And Eric said, I have an idea for a company based on a new chip. And it's because of our current level of processing power, we can do something that wasn't practical to do before. And I said, well, what's your idea? And he said, I think we can make a chip that can read anything. And I was like, that's so cool. That's my one good idea from college. And so we actually went out and raised $25 million in venture capital over several years and built a machine that could read anything. So this was my first startup. And um, I often tell all these stories and people say, oh, Jim, you've had this unrelenting story of success. I said, well, actually, I started seven high-tech companies in Silicon Valley and only five failed. So the rocket company failed, a bunch of other things failed, but this is the one that, that worked. So we managed to get the money, and we built the machine that could read anything. And to get the money, we had to promise people that we would make them a lot of money. Right? This is kind of the deal if you're going to get $25 million in venture capital. So we talked about scanning the mail and scanning tax forms and scanning contracts for lawyers because the idea of a reading machine was, or a scanner was that you would scan the page and then it would translate that into a processor file or a database entry so that a human wouldn't have to type it in. And so we went off and we actually built the company. We got up to 125, 150 people. Um, I'll come back to what happened next to that company. But this idea of making a reading machine for the blind was still making us all excited because it was the coolest thing you could do with this technology. So we actually, let's see, we, could I borrow a piece of paper? So, yeah, thank you. The release is fine. Yeah, okay. So, so, so we basically had this system and we were selling it. It was pretty expensive at the time, but we knew it was going to get cheaper. And one day, after sort of a secret project, I was demoing a new product to our venture capital board of directors. So seated around the table in a conference room in Santa Clara were all these people, each one representing a firm that had put at least a million dollars in our company. And we had our, our scanner there that we had built. And so what we did is we like scanned the page, you know, and, and it took a picture of the page. And then our secret sauce translated that page into a, basically a word processor document and sent that over to a computer that had a first generation voice synthesizer on it. You know, and it started to speak the first line of what was on the page. You know, these are the times that try men's souls. But it wasn't quite that natural sounding. <laughs> and so the board was like, cool. The demo worked. Jim, you're the vice president of marketing. What's the market size for reading machines to the blind? I said, wow, we, we think it's about $1 million per year. You can imagine the long silence that ensued until finally one of the investors said, and the connection to the $25 million we've collectively invested in this firm is what exactly? And I said, well, it's going to be a million dollar a year break even business. It'll be great public relations. Our employees will be proud of us. Our engineers, our marketing people, we all love the product. And they said, no way. They vetoed the project. And I argued with them. I said, you know, this is socially so important. We've got to help blind people read, and, and, we, could, and we can do it, and it won't, we won't lose money at it. And they said, you took $25 million in venture capital. You're at $15 million a year in revenue right now, and your plan said you were supposed to be at 35. You're still losing money, and you're probably going to need another round of funding. And really, we do not want you guys distracted from doing anything other than fulfilling your promise to make us boatloads of money. And of course, we had made that promise to them. So it was 
a completely fair argument from a business standpoint and from a commitment standpoint. But socially, it was kind of like, oh, I was really bummed. So by this time, I actually had several lawyers who worked for us. And I went to one of my lawyers, and I complained. I said, the board vetoed the project. And he said, hmm, why don't you start a deliberately nonprofit technology company? And I kind of giggled because, of course, most Silicon Valley high tech companies are accidentally nonprofit, <laughs> even though they're supposed to be on for profit. And so, so we said, wow, we'd be like successful by like, definition. If we lost money, we'd still be nonprofit. It would be cool. I'm like, I love that. Move the goalposts. We're, we, could, we could do that. And so, um, so I was carrying this idea around. Soon thereafter, our venture capitalist fired our CEO, which is kind of the typical thing you do when it's not making plan and all that. And the new CEO came in. And I say, I quit. And he said, well, uh, ah. He said, you could start a competitor. You could hire away your all employees. And I said, nah, nah. Just pay me six months of salary and let me start a nonprofit tech company to build the reading machines for the blind. And we'll be a customer. All I really need is a deep, deep discount and credit. And so we signed a severance deal. I got the six months of pay. And we started our Reading Machine for the Blind as a 501c3 nonprofit, so a traditional charity. But our idea was instead of giving these things away, we'd sell them. And to a Silicon Valley person, a million dollar year break even market was not a business. That was a nonprofit because it really wasn't going to make enough money. So what happened? Um, within three years, we were $5 million a year. We were profitable. Actually, profitable means we were basically break even. We would operate a little bit above um, you know, losing money. And then if we lost money, we'd, we'd spend less. If we made money, we'd reinvest in something cool like translating into Portuguese or giving a low interest loan program or something like that. And, um, and so uh, the fact that we were profitable was kind of awkward. And we had a IRS audit. Uh, and they said, uh, you guys are a nonprofit charity, and you're taking no donations, and you're actually profitable. And I said, uh, what good is a tax exemption if there aren't occasionally profits that you don't pay taxes on? The auditor was not amused. <laughs> but we managed to survive the audit because oh, you know, the market was going to fail to do this in an effective way, which is why we were starting this as a nonprofit. And so we went on. We <laughs> sold, I don't know. Probably, you know, we're probably at $5 million a year. The nature of the tech field is that prices kind of go down all the time. So our prices would just keep going down. So it started a, we started as a $5,000 reading machine when the traditional reading machines that were out there that weren't as good were like $12,000. And then went from five, four, three, two, one point eight, fifteen hundred dollars 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 $1,000, $1,000. And every time the price fell, the number of people could afford to buy a reading machine went up. So we were serving more and more people. We were still break even. We were still $5 million a year. So we actually had pulled off a business that was delivering these reading machines to a group of people that, before this, were either relying on someone to read books to them, getting a few books on tape. So, but we were able to, like students, for example, who had to read others' assignments, they were able to do their book scanning. They were able to read the book the professor assigned even if it wasn't something that had been recorded, because they could scan it themselves. So we basically gave them a tool for independence. We probably over that time period sold about 40,000 reading systems. One interesting thing we learned about three or four years in, which may not surprise you guys as much, but we were kind of stunned, we did a survey of all of our customers just to find out more about how they were using the product so we could do a better job. And it um, turned out that we found out that 15% of our customers were dyslexic. They weren't blind. And we were doing everything wrong for dyslexic people, with one exception. Um, we had sort of a karaoke style where the voice synthesizer would read the word, and we would visually highlight it at the same time. So you'd see each word, and it would be spotlighted as it was read aloud. That turns out to be the killer app for dyslexic kids, because a lot of kids with severe dyslexia lack any decoding skills. Like, you, know, you show them constitution, they can't sound it out. But if you show them constitution and say it, they, many of them can become sight readers. So we're actually teaching them to read these words. We kind of accidentally, because we were geeks, thought it was cool if we made this visually highlighted. But the user interface was 100% wrong. It talked. It was very keyboard driven, because that's what's right for, for, for blind people. So we re made it sort of more like a Mac-like interface, but where if you hit a button, it would actually read the text aloud. And so, so anyway, a lot of our users end up being dyslexic. So. Um, we did this for about 10 years. 
Um, a lot of my friends in Silicon Valley were saying, why are you doing this? You know, why are you, why are you doing a nonprofit? You could be making a lot more money, especially during the dot-com boom. People were saying things like, Jim, you could be making a billion dollars selling dog food over the internet. I'm like, but I really help, you know, I really like helping disabled people and it's cool and I'm having fun. But after 10 years of doing the same thing, I was getting a little bored, those types of things. And, and I saw a lot of other needs. We had been, we talked to the human rights movement about things that they needed. We are talking to disabled people about other things that they might need. And we were kind of a little stuck because as a break-even business, we had no extra money to reinvest. We had actually invented a talking map for the blind and GPS for the blind and had to put it on the back burner because we didn't have enough money to, to keep it going. So I was kind of struggling with this. And I thought, well, I'll raise all those money from dot-com billionaires. Unfortunately, most of the dot-com billionaires during the dot-com period were really busy making their billion dollars and then promptly dealing with the fact that they were losing their billion dollars. And so, so I couldn't get very much of their attention. But someone came and asked to buy our reading machine for the blind business from us. So a venture-backed group that wanted to buy this. So um, I kind of, first when they came by, I said, go away. We're nonprofit. We don't want to sell. And then he came back three months later and said, Jim, tell me your aspirations. Now, this is a negotiating ploy, but I'm enough of a geek that I did not recognize that it was a negotiating ploy. So I actually told him, well, I've got this idea for helping human rights groups, and I have other ideas for helping disabled people, and, and I don't have any money to do it. And he said, OK, tell you what, I'll pay you $5 million. You and your engineers can stay in the nonprofit. Rent your engineers back to me, because this is the peak of the dot-com boom, so it's very hard to hire engineers. And you can go off and do those new things after a year of transition. So to sell a nonprofit is actually kind of hard. Um, there are reasons why it's kind of discouraged. So we had to convince the attorney general in California, their office, that it was a good thing for society, that basically you had a social enterprise before, and then afterwards a for-profit would own the social enterprise and probably do more social good. Prices would stay the same or go down. And we'd use the money to start one or two new social enterprises. And so we actually got the AG to approve it. And so in April of 2000, we had $5 million in cash and the goal to do new things. And that's a particularly important moment because that's the quarter the dot-com bubble popped. And so we got lucky. So I'm going to pause there for a second because I have run through sort of this lightning sort of round kind of discussion of how we got to this point. What we did with that money is kind of the story of what Benetech is today. And I'm looking forward to telling you that story. But I want to give you a chance to ask questions about the stuff that I've rattled off. Um, and I can take questions in the middle, or I can take questions further on. But I just want to give you a shot if you said, I don't really get how that reading machine worked. Or why did people come work for you? Or whatever it might be. So any, any questions before I charge forward? OK. Oh, yes. I'd love to ask the second part. Hmm? I assume you paid less seller than out of competitors. So yeah. how did you really motivate people? To so um, so we, we usually sell um, uh, less monetary benefits. Um, our salaries are below average for Silicon Valley, but that still makes them the top 10% for the nonprofit sector. So we pay well by nonprofit standards, but not a, we'll never win a, a bidding war with a well-funded tech company. Mm -hmm. Um, and during boom and bust periods, you know, during bust periods it's a little easier to recruit, during boom periods it's a little harder. So what we have to do is first sell them on, do you actually want to work on something that changes the world as opposed to making money for your investors? Um, and people at every stage of their career, are actually there are people who are interested in having that conversation. But it's fresh grads that have the flexibility to do what they want, people who are five years in who have a significant other or have saved up some money or, you know, figure that they can live on $60,000 a year rather than 95 or 100,000 a year instead of 150, whatever the numbers are. Um, we also sell quality of life, right? We have more flexibility. A lot of people work from home on Fridays. You know, some, some of those kind of the benefits. Um, good benefits. We actually have richer benefits than a lot of for-profits do. Um, and, um, and we're very friendly to families. So we're a rare tech company where the majority of our professionals and our managerial team and our executive team are women. Um, and, that, and we you know, accommodate people who choose to have children. We're actually very much in favor of that. So, so I think what we do is we don't have to change everyone in Silicon Valley's attitude towards working for less than top dollar. We just have to find, you know, right now, the, the 80 people who work for us who are convinced that this is something that they can either do long term or do for a few years. So do I have any other questions? 
Okay. Well, actually, I'll tell you my first ad, though. Um, during my severance deal, I wasn't paid. So I, I posted an ad that said, as the assistant to the CEO of the largest nonprofit reading machine for the blind manufacturer in the world, that's how we hired our first employee. <laughs> so who you know, ended up really setting our culture. Did you have a question back there? Yeah. You know, um, what, what we did is we maintained the right to buy the company back if they basically stopped doing it. So we had essentially a call to pull it back for society if they didn't follow through on this. Um, but under, they weren't interested in buying a license if we were going to keep doing it. Because for them, uh, the business proposition for this company was they bought the biggest Braille maker, they bought the largest uh, screen reader, which is what makes Microsoft Word talk. And they bought us as the largest reading machine for the blind and dyslexic company. And by taking our $5 million a year business and combining it with a couple bigger businesses, they had a $50 million a year business. And that's how they're actually able to raise the money to get the company going. And you know, once you start talking business, they're pretty, they're pretty pointed. But you know, like any founder, you feel like you could run the company better than the people who took it over from you. But in practice, I was able to accomplish a lot more after 10 years of sort of moving on and having a fresh start. And, and I think that kind of paid off. So we had $5 million. What do, what do we do with it? The, um, the two leading ideas we had was one, work for the human rights movement. Um, the human rights movement is sort of an information processing industry where no one writes software for it. And I had been motivated because I'd read a story in actually the early 90s, about a massacre that happened in El Salvador in the early 80s. Um, it was uh, called the El Mazzotti Massacre. A US trained battalion of Salvadorian troops killed everybody in a single village, like 600 people. It made the front page of the New York Times. The Salvador Salvadorian government said it didn't happen. The US government said it didn't happen. The reporter was fired. The Reagan administration certified El Salvador as being really a wonderful place for human rights, I think three or four months later, and they got a whole bunch of military aid from us and all the like. 10 years later, an Argentinian forensic team went to the site and found more than 500 bodies buried there. And so this story came out a decade later, and it really ticked me off. So I called up my, uh, my old boss, uh, Dave Ross. Uh, who had you know, founded these companies with me, was my old boss from the Rocket Project. And we did the dish run, but we walked it, um, talking about what you could do with technology to stop something like this from happening. And you know, we both are, you know, we were physicists, we're geeky. You know. Could you build defensive force fields that would protect villages against attackers? And oh, if we could invent such a force field, it would take uh, a nuclear power plant for a village of energy. OK, scratch that idea. Uh, but we came back by the end of the run saying pretty much it's about information. You know, the only tool that human rights activists have against the people with guns, the people with authority that are doing these terrible things is in some sense the truth. If we could use technology to make it harder to deny the truth of this kind of human rights violation, we could actually tip the balance. So we went around, we talked to a lot of the human rights groups, um, and we found out that essentially no one wrote software for them. Our initial pitch to them was that we would do spying for human rights, drones and satellite imagery, because we're really geeky. And the group said, um, actually, we're having problems with our text. I'm like, text? Yeah, people come in and tell us stories about the terrible things that happened to them and their families, and we write it down, or we put it in Microsoft Word documents, and then we lose them. It was amazing to me. I, I figure that of the groups we talked to, if you had collected these stories five years earlier, chances were 95% the stories were gone. They're gone because the computer crashed and they weren't backed up. They were gone because they're on paper. And in one group we talked to, termites ate five years worth of files in Sri Lanka. Uh, they were gone because the groups ran out of money. They were suppressed by the government. Um, they had a suspicious fire that burned all their records. I mean, it just, so people, someone, had something terrible happen to them or someone in their family or their community, they went in and they took the risk to talk to a human rights group and nothing happened. So what we can do, well first, we can make sure we don't lose it. Two, we can make it harder for the government to spy on them. So we introduced strong crypto, 
sort of thing that, that Edward Snowden would tell you to use. Uh, but we started doing it you know, about 10 years ago. Um, we backed up everything off-site. Um, and the first thing we found out is that um, we built it and no one came. It was open source and free, didn't cost anything, but we had to essentially market it. And most of these groups actually don't care about security. Even though they're running incredible risks, they don't care about security. A lot of the reason why people don't care about backup until they've had a giant disaster, right? You know? So what we had to do is actually solve their information problem. So now we've learned that when we talk to a human rights group, we say, well, what are your top three mission objectives? What kind of information do you collect? By the way, that's probably the only asset that human rights groups have is their staff, their volunteers, their human capital, and the information they collect. That's it. The other side has got guns. They've got databases that are tracking people. We want to tip that balance. So make sure they don't lose the information. Make sure that as information is collected over time, we can use it for more powerful advocacy. If we ever get to a point where we're actually doing a justice exercise, whether it's a war crimes tribunal, whether it's a truth and reconciliation commission, we can be their information sort of tool makers. So we're not actually a human rights group, but our job is to make David that much more powerful against Goliath. And so um, I'm going to just take you to what we're doing today in that area before I go on to some of the other things we do. So today, um, we've been working with Burmese groups for eight years. So over the last decade, terrible things have been going on in Burma. Um, we got 12 different groups to all collect information using our software. These groups don't all get along, but they were all using our software to collect the story. After five or six years, they had 20 or 30,000 stories of things that were going on in Burma, collected from refugees, collected from going in there. And they said, can you do an analysis of these stories? And so they said, what are the top three human rights violations that are happening in Burma? Um, torture, land confiscation, so people take away your land, they don't give you any money for it, um, and forced labor. Um, the men in the village are taken away for three months to build a road or a bridge or something, and they're not compensated. They're basically just fed. So those are all you know, against human rights violations. So now these groups, especially today when there's a political opening in, in Burma, and you know, the opposition leader has been freed and they're actually able, able to run for, for office, now they could actually, rather than trying to figure out what happened over the last decade in Burma, they've actually got tens of thousands of stories. They've got analysis of the patterns that they observed. And now they can be talking about policy. Maybe we reform the security forces so they don't torture minority women in, in, our, in our country. Um, maybe we give people back money for the land that was taken away from them, for the land that was given to family members of the military um, leadership. So, um, so a more couple current examples. Um, our team has worked in genocide trials. We were in the genocide trial of Rios Mont um, last summer based on data that was, was basically analyzed by, by uh, Benetech and the testimony was actually given by our former chief scientist uh, based on work that he did at Benetech. Um, basically testifying that if you were in a Shiel Indian during the period where Rios Mont was the dictator of Guatemala, your chances of being killed were eight times any other ethnic group in that country. Was that genocide? And that's up for the courts to decide. But as the geeks, we're helping testify to what the data says. Um, and Rios Mont was actually briefly convicted of, of genocide. And then the Supreme Court reversed the ruling. And he'll probably die in house arrest or something like that. But because you know, sometimes you don't get all the way through to the, to the end because of the other political things. Um, one of our biggest areas right now working with lesbian and gay groups in Africa. Um, we've been working with them for almost three years. Uh, you know, the, 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 these are very um, discouraging times, the lesbian and gay movement in lots of parts of, of Africa. Uh, probably our biggest partnerships are in Uganda. Um, one of our closest partners was outed on an, basically on the front page of a national newspaper. Um, and so they're collecting basically stories of the human rights violations experienced by lesbian and gay people in Uganda. and several other countries in Africa and actually the Caribbean as well. And, um, and they're, uh, the other thing, and this is not what our software is designed to do, but they're also backing up their membership lists because quite a number of gay groups are experiencing police raids where the police are trying to get a list of all the gay people so they can go and out them to their families, to their employers, to their landlords, and they've been doing this. And so now suddenly we're finding that 
since this is a secure place to put things where you actually are the person in charge of who gets to see it, you could actually back up your membership lists and lower the risks to the members of your group. So um, anyway, the human rights movement is, is progressing on. Um, what Snowden has kind of taught us is that every government, almost without trying, is going to be vacuum cleaning up every piece of information. So much of what the nonprofit world does is gather basically very personal information about very vulnerable populations, and they're not very sophisticated about the security. So imagine if you essentially made a list and handed it to the government of every domestic violence, every rape victim, every person who's HIV positive, every person who's identified as lesbian or gay, every refugee, your political status, your religious affiliation, whether you're a refugee, the list goes on and on. And even if you trust today's government, do you really want them to have a list that tomorrow's government might choose to victimize these people who've already been victimized, but victimize them again because someone was trying to help them and didn't treat their information very confidentially. So we're spending a lot of time talking to the, because you know, we're, we're from Silicon Valley, we know about security. We get help from all the big tech companies because people really want to see technology used for good and it's quite often accidentally being used, well, accidentally by, by, by the engineers who develop it, but not so accidentally by the people who use it. So I'll pause there to talk about human rights, and then I'll talk to you about our biggest project, and then we'll do the, the big roll-up. So any questions about human rights before I, I go on to a new area? Yes? How do you decide who you're going to work with? So our software is open source and free, so anyone can use it. And that's mainly for... Um, transparency reasons. If I come from the United States and give you a piece of software and say, you can't look at the source code, what's your assurance there's not a backdoor to the CIA or the NSA in there? Nothing, right? So, so we're mainly open source for transparency reasons, but it also helps us deal with um, political critiques of where we get our money. If I'm Human Rights Watch, I don't take U.S. government funding because I don't want to criticize U.S. government less because I might be taking their money. We're, we don't take advocacy stands. Our users take advocacy stands, and our job is to give them the most powerful software. So we get US government funding, for example. And I remember having a conversation with one of the senior people at Human Rights Watch. And her comment was, so the US government's going to give you money to develop software that's open source that anyone can use, even people who are highly critical of US foreign policy. I'm like, yeah. She said, take the money. <laughs> so I think the second question is, who do we give extra levels of support to? And we do have a triage mechanism um, that our team uses because we get far more requests for help than we can actually deliver for reasons that may be obvious. So we'll probably do a little bit of help over the email or over Skype with anyone who wants to use the software. We'll say it's free. But if they say, can you please fly to Kazakhstan and give us a three-day training, we say, OK, where are we going to find the 10000 so, bucks? So one thing is, what are we being asked for? What will it cost? Are we funded to do this already? So like, if we get a call from a new lesbian group in Zimbabwe, we already have a grant for that. But if we get asked to do that in Nigeria, we don't have a grant for that. So we have to go out and find some money for it. Um, we also look at, will the technology actually help this group? So I'd say probably half the groups that contact us thinking that they might want to do technology, we actually talk to them and we realize that they probably aren't going to be successful at the technology. Um, our groups are not the rawest of grassroots groups because they're basically trying to stay in existence. They're trying to deal directly with victim services. Or you know, they're tracking four legal cases. OK, you don't need a lot of technology to track four legal cases. But when the groups start growing, and they realize the problem's not going away, and then if they captured the 10 or the 20 or the 50 cases they do every month, after a year, they would have hundreds of cases or thousands of cases. Those are the groups that tend to be really successful with, with, our, with our project. So you know, we probably trained 40 LGBT groups in four African countries probably less than 10 are going to be successful at scale with our technology. Did I see another question on human rights over here? Or did I just, OK. All right. So going on to the next thing. Um, this idea came from my then teenage son, Jimmy, who's now, I think, 28, um, or will be soon. Um, so at the time, Jimmy was 14. Um, and I didn't see very much of Jimmy, like most fathers of 14-year-old sons. You know? But one night I came home, um, and there was a new icon on our home computer. And it was a shared computer, and I had lectured my kids, don't install software from the internet. And so I yelled, who, who installed this software? And my son Jimmy came and said, Dad, I cannot tell a lie. I installed the software, but it wasn't from the internet. I'm like, oh, 
Where do you come from then? Well, you know, Chris, oh, you're a friend in the rock band, yeah. Well, his mom, Eileen, is the acting CEO of a startup, and the software is from her startup. I'm like, oh, no problem. What's the name of the startup? She says, oh, it's called Napster. <laughs> now, at that moment, I had no idea what Napster was. So I'm like, oh, can you show me what Napster is? So I then sat down with my 14-year-old son, and for an hour, you know, he was downloading 90s punk because it was 1999 or early 2000. I was downloading Van Halen and Pat Benatar. You know, I had music like that when I was your age kind of thing. And we had the best hour. I'm like, this is miraculous. I'll pay anything for this. So Jimmy, what does Napster cost? Oh, it's free, Dad. Well, yeah, I know during the beta period it's free, but what, what is it going to cost when it really gets going? He says, no, Dad, it's free. It's completely free. It's always going to be free. And, and I'm like, oh, this is so illegal. <laughs> But the technology, it's so cool. So I called up my, my intellectual property lawyer, and I said, we have 40,000 people scanning the same books over and over again. Right When Harry Potter, which was the hot book for, for teenagers, was coming out at that time, you know, we had 3,000 families going out and buying Harry Potter. And in the first week, they would spend three or four hours turning it page by page at a home scanner. And then you know, after the expenditure of multiple person years, we had a few thousand families that each had a low quality OCR error filled version of Harry Potter. I said, what if we scan it once, <coughs> proofread it once, and then share it not only with the 3,000 families that might do it, but maybe another 10 or 20,000 families that wouldn't bother investing three or four hours before they could read the book. And we'll call it Bookster. <laughs> and so my attorney went off and did a little bit of legal research. And it turns out that it's legal in the United States to do this. And I was really excited, because usually when you come up with something that should be illegal, it is illegal. But this was one of those rare cases. And my lawyer said, but one other thing, don't call it Bookster. <laughs> but I said, but it's such a cool name. I'd already gotten the domain. You know, I was going out and talking to blind people about Bookster. They're like, oh, Jim, the guy who did the reading machine, he's going to do Bookster. It's going to be great. You know? So people started saving up their books. And, and my lawyer said, you know, you should go and talk to the publishers. So rather than being Napster, which kind of surprised the music industry with Napster, why don't you give them some advance warning? So my lawyer arranged a presentation for me and, and, and him to give a talk to the Copyright Committee of the Publishers Association. So this is the general counsels, the chief lawyers of all the publishers. So we give them this great story. There's, and by then, we had changed the name to Bookshare, because it wasn't going to go if we called it Bookster. So we, we said, ah, Bookshare is going to be great. People are going to scan books. And then for the people who can't buy your print books, and isn't this going to be great? And, um, and they said, uh, nobody has come and told us of their plans to steal our content in advance before. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not theft. It's the bargain and copyright law. You guys make money, and we represent society, and we do this social good, and we'll balance it. So, the publishers um, that were most freaked out, you guys might have some understanding of what segment of the publishing industry is the most freaked out about the possibility of all their books being free. Anyone want to hazard a guess? Textbook. textbook publishers. So they said, don't do textbooks. And the copyright law says nothing about textbooks. But we decided that we would not prohibit textbooks, we would de-emphasize textbooks. We would focus on essentially literature and what people wanted to read. So Bookshare quickly became one of the largest libraries for the blind and dyslexic in the world for basically two reasons. One, um, crowdsourcing. Um, that's what we'd call it today. But essentially, rather than us picking what books blind and dyslexic people would read, we said, if you thought it was worth scanning, we think it's worth sharing with everybody else. So we had one guy who gave us 3,000 books the month we opened. He had been scanning a science fiction book a day. This guy I, I really get along with well <laughs> for 10 years, because that's about how long we'd had reading machines. And so uh, I think he enslaved his family, actually. But, uh, <laughs> but, but anyway, 3,000 science fiction books. So if you wanted Star Trek number 267, we had it right away. And, so, uh, and the second breakthrough technologically was the state of the art at the time was audio cassette tapes read by human beings. More natural sounding. The voice synthesizers are better, but more natural sounding, but very expensive. So you can only, the, the Library of Congress does about 2,000 books a year 
still today. 2,000 books a year, and I mean, and 200,000 books are published in English every year in the United States. It's like a huge gulf. So they could only do a very few books. So what we said is, if you thought it was worth scanning, so suddenly all these books started flooding in. Um, and because it was an e-book, not a human narrated book, um, I can push a button, I have a braille printer. If I have a braille display that pops up braille pins, I can read it in braille real time. If I'm low vision and I can't see so well, I can magnify it on the screen of, of a PC or a tablet, or I can actually print it out bigger. Um, I can speak it aloud. I can turn it into an MP3 file. So it's really flexible. So um, anyway, the publishing industry warned us against um, textbooks. We stayed away from textbooks for the first couple of years. But then students with disabilities came to us and said, this is such a huge need. You know, we're not getting the books we need to succeed in high school and in college especially. Um, so we, uh, we went back to the publishers after a couple of years and said, hey, the world didn't end because of Bookshare. It wasn't the bookster you were worried about. <laughs> it's actually helping people and not contributing to piracy. And so um, anyway, we started doing textbooks. Because we started doing textbooks, we got more and more demand. Department of Education, which had always given away money as earmarks to the people who made the audiobooks, one year decided to run a competition. And as a novice bidder with a million dollar a year social enterprise that was losing money, we won a $6.5 million a year, five year contract from the Department of Education to deliver books to all disabled students in the United States. That was a little bit less than seven years ago. At the time, we were serving about 3,000 students. Today, we serve 300,000 students. And we're growing at a compound annual growth rate of 20%. We are at a quarter million titles. We added 20,000 books last month. Now, that was an unusual month. Penguin decided to give us all their books in one month, um, and so, which, was, which was great. Because uh, Penguin used to belong to Pearson, which is kind of nasty. But then they got out from under Pearson. And now they're nice. And so they said, here, have all the Penguin books. We're like, yes. So this is the other thing that happened unusually. The publishers, after a few years, went, wait a minute. You're scanning our books? But we're already making them in e-books, right? So now we have 250 publishers who give us all their ebooks the same time they put them in the Kindle or onto your iPad because we're serving that 1% or 2% of the population that can't read a standard book, needs it to be talking, needs it to be Braille. So it's an example of using technology in an area that, again, a $5 million a year, $8 million a year break-even business would never have attracted venture capital. And yet we're able to solve most of a social problem with technology and actually, we didn't solve the social problem. The community we served solved it for each other. We were just the technologists who put the tools in their hands to do it. So I could go on, but let me tell you, every week I get asked to do three or four products for the social sector with the same kind of market failure problem. The technology exists. The off-the-shelf software, you know, we don't need a word process for human rights groups or a spreadsheet for environmental groups, but there's something about every field of endeavor that's different. In human rights, it's tracking victim statements and, and atrocity information. In environment, it's planning environmental projects or surveying forests for illegal deforestation and logging, whatever it might be. There's something about that that they need specifically. And the for-profit world looks and says, eh. Why would I do that? And yet the payoff is huge. All the same kind of wealth generation leverage that we have. You know, Bill Gates makes one copy of Microsoft Office and sells a gazillion of them. You know, we make one version of a software package. We can deliver it really cheaply. So we can do free versions of this. Most of our stuff is open source and free. We can get people to pay us on the side, just like a lot of Silicon Valley is around coming up with a business model. So we get to use all the tools our team get to use all the experience they have from being in tech companies, but instead of focusing on maximizing how much money they make, they focus on maximizing the number of people that we can help, and financially all we have to do is break even. So Benetech today, $14 million a year tech company with eight products in three different social sector verticals, human rights, education, and environment. Um, most tech companies our size would be working on one product. But our products are really small. So we actually have sort of a portfolio effect. So when one of them runs out of money for engineers, we move those engineers over to something so we don't have to lay them off. And we get to go out there and every day answer questions from disabled people, teachers, activists all over the world and say, yeah, we, 
we're from Silicon Valley and we actually care enough to help you. <laughs> it's, it's what most people in Silicon Valley dream about doing and they're told over and over again, but that doesn't pencil out. How are you gonna make 30 or 40% return for your investors on that? And so people are told, put it on the shelf. And I'm here to say, we can make a living, a good living, we can get benefits, we can take care of our families, we can go to the tech companies and ask them for their crown jewels, the intellectual property that makes their companies rich. We say, please give it to us for free worldwide. And they say yes, 80% of the time. And people are surprised. Those greedy bastards in Silicon Valley, how, why would they do that? Because they're really proud of what they do. And they're frustrated that they're told not to use it for 99% of humanity. And so if I show up and say, I can help this segment, not mess with your market, not get your shareholders mad at you, and make your employees, your team, really proud of what you've created, people love to say yes to that. So one of the reasons I come and I talk to students, it's one of my favorite things to do, is because many of you are going to be in positions of power in companies where you get to make the decision about what happens with that intellectual property. And if you take anything away, be open to what in the old fashioned term, giving the sleeves off your vest that doesn't cost your company anything and it does a lot of good, what, that's what humanity really needs. And if you do choose to be a social entrepreneur and take this on, um, I'm hoping to actually later this year publish the pipeline of the two or 300 things we got asked to do this year. We'll be able to do one, two of those. I'm trying to figure out how to do 10 or 20 at one go. I've got one idea that might do that, but that still leaves a few hundred ideas that no one is gonna tackle. And some of them will generate revenue, but I can promise you they'll actually solve a major social problem. And if we have time, I'll give you some of, just some of the things I've got asked to do in the last few months. It's amazing what's out there. And we've created these incredible platforms that make, we're so close. It's just people don't go that last mile because they figure out how to make money. Anyway, I think you got my message. Happy to answer questions about what we do, why we do it, how you could do it, the things that need to be done. Um, I'd just love to share more with you guys, and thanks for your attention today. So we have like 20 or 30 minutes for questions? Yep, that's OK, right. so save up those questions. What, what do you guys got in mind? What, what are you wondering about? Yes? I'm wondering, one, like, give us one or two of these ideas. <laughs> yeah, I kind of, kind of dangled it. Um, I think 10 or 15 look to me as a marketing tech guy like the same app and people think they're different apps. So, so I've gotten asked the variation on the same question. I need an Android app that will help my employees, my vendors, my volunteers, my community, you know, the general public to give me this data about this phenomenon in the social sector and send it maybe securely, maybe they don't mention security, to a server somewhere where I can get all the data and analyze it and figure out what's going on. So that's the general case. But social sector people aren't geeks, so they describe the problem in terms of, here's the problem I want to solve. So yesterday morning I was talking to a lawyer who leads one of the major international anti-torture groups. And her dream is that everyone who gets arrested sees a lawyer as soon as possible. Because if you see a lawyer, the odds that you'll be tortured go way down. Now, everybody in the developing world kind of knows this. And in certain countries, it's pretty common that most people who are arrested get tortured. Because you, know, you get arrested, the policeman beats you up until you confess to the crime, and then the policeman has solved the crime. Yay, <laughs> score, right? You know? So anyway, her dream is to get people, she says, but she doesn't have any data. You know, she picked a specific country. Um, I won't name the country because it's her story. Um, but it's a large country, not the United States, where, um, where most people, everyone thinks that most people get tortured who are in custody. But she doesn't have any data on it. So she says, you mean I could have a piece of software where all the lawyers in our network could actually kind of like answer three quick questions and do it in a way that depending, doesn't matter what language they answered in, that says, you know, you know, how long had the person been you know, in, in, uh, in custody before you met with them? Had they been tortured? Maybe one or two other questions. And then we could actually, over time, get tens or hundreds of thousands of, 
of these data points, and then we could go to the government and say, you know, of all the you know, prisoners that our network has seen, 80% of them were tortured in their first week in custody. What are we going to do about this from a policy standpoint? So that's one example. Um, I got asked uh, by two different labor rights groups to do something around labor rights. Um, one group goes into factories and they ask workers about uh, basically labor practices that are prohibited in the supply chain of major brands. Um, so, you know, uh, if you're for Levi's, you know, any sandblasting equipment weathering these jeans, because that's something that Levi says they won't do anymore because it causes terrible silicosis in the workers. So, oh, here's a factory that's in the Levi's supply chain that's doing it. So they go and they ask questions, they inspect the factory. So what they want to do is go in and ask the same workers, and the workers might read five different languages or speak to five different languages. So they want to ask the same questions, but have it all work in their, this is easy to do technically. And then all roll up and so, Tomorrow morning, as they're getting ready to actually inspect the factory, they've already talked to a bunch of workers. They've been highlighted to certain issues that they should be looking for. Um, an hour after I spoke to that, the guy who heads that group, the woman who heads the group that um, uh, does Good Weave, which is the, um, the group, they put a, a rug, basically a certification on your rug that no child or slave made this rug. So they basically go and they inspect what is mainly a home loom business in Asia. And what they do is they want to go in and take a picture of the rug and the person working on the loom in the home. Why? They want to make sure that the rug gets delivered is the one that they inspected several times during the process. And they want to see, oh, we dropped in un unannounced, and there was a 12-year-old working on the loom, which is prohibited. So we can't put that rug, put a mark on that rug saying that no kids made this rug. So um, it's the same app. I could go on. I mean. Guys doing sanitation want to collect how much uh, organic waste is hauled away from each house. Um, uh, labor, uh, no, election monitoring people want to say, send out people and say, tell us if you couldn't vote. Uh, human rights groups want to do you know, similar things. Anti-corruption groups want to have volunteers go around and take pictures of mob-affiliated businesses and so that investigative reporters can investigate who owns that building and whether or not the title is cloud. I mean, anyway, it's the same kind of app. And then on the back end, we can you know, put it on maps, use satellite imagery, getting back to my drone idea eventually. <laughs> uh, you know, we could actually solve their problem. And rather than charging each one to develop its own app, we build this centralized infrastructure, open source and free, so if you want to do it. And then you know, the group that has no money, go to a website, plug in some things, push a button, and three hours later, a Google Play Store app is up with the name of your organization that collects data and stores it securely in the cloud. Oh, you want to customize, customize really fancy sort of thing. You, know, you want to give a tablet to a microcredit borrower, and rather than the microcredit loan officer deciding how poor you are, have uh, the person who's the borrower, the poor person, actually decide how poor she thinks she is by answering a pictorial questionnaire that has three different pictures of, do you walk more than 100 meters for water or drink dirty water? Do you uh, walk less than 100 meters for clean water? Or do you have a tap in your house, which is very poor, poor, or not poor? Boy, OK, that'll take a little extra work, but we can do that. So, And then we get a bunch of geeks from certain tech companies in this area to volunteer to help us with this, and we're on our way. So anyway, I answered that question at great length. So well, maybe I. So they can get some shorter questions or answers in. So, oh, there, yeah. So you talked about getting um, geeks in the area to help you out with mm -hmm. these problems, and you have this big list of things you'd like to get done, mm -hmm. and, and you know, a lot of times there are things that you can't get done. Have you thought about trying to source students to help you solve the problems? So, um, so we uh, we do a couple things. Um, we have a project called Social Coding for Good, and it's mapping open source social good projects like ours and Wikipedia and Mozilla and Code for America and Ushahidi and Frontline SMS and Me Mobile Medic, Medic Mobile, um, the list goes on. But all these guys who need software up with Silicon Valley tech people who want to volunteer, usually at companies like VMware and HP and Cisco and Google and blah, blah, blah. So right now we have that matchmaking going on. We have a lot of big projects. So, um, and depending on the model, sometimes people get 
kind of a weekend hackathon that might give them some prototypes for something that might work, so they could just try it out. Um, or they might get some longer term volunteers. We've had some volunteers who are paid by their company to work for three months uh, on a project. So that, that actually really helps the, the nonprofit group. On the student side, um, uh, we, um, we do Google Summer of Code, which is where Google pays students to work on open source social good projects. And the reason Google does this is it's a great recruiting tool for Google. So there's a perfectly good business reason for this. And what we do is we commit to mentor the student, and Google pays them five or six grand for the summer to do this. Um, we have used some student projects. Um, they tend to be more about describing math and science books so that blind kids can take high school math. Um, we probably don't do as much with coders, unless they're the kind of coders who show up. And sometimes this is high school students or college students who are really capable coders, but we're not actually an educational institution. So we will partner with a school that says, we'll do all the care and feeding of the students that are learning to code, but we don't want to, we have, we have very little resources. So that's kind of the balancing act we do. Um, but, um, but what we like to do is, you know, we're talking about doing a competition where a bunch of students could actually like compete, and then essentially someone would judge the stuff, and we'd guess that the top three to five solutions would be, and they'd have to be open source. That would be something that we could borrow and then build on. So, so that's the way that we're, we're trying to come up with a transactionally efficient way to deal with students, given that we have eight senior engineers. And so and they can't spend a ton of time. So. OK, so um, yes? I have a question regarding growth and scale of the company going forward. Mm -hmm. So um, would, would you advocate for a nonprofit from foundations or any kind of impact investments that aren't just grants to kind of scale and do more of these projects. We have to hire more engineers mm -hmm. to have more capacity and bandwidth. So um, uh, a paper that I wrote, it was published by Stanford Social Innovation Review, it's called For Love or Lucre, whether to start a for-profit or a non-profit when you're starting a social enterprise. And the short story, it's 4,000 words, but is that if you can make money and do social good, you should be a for-profit. So Benetech has a way of picking projects where, and we, we call it often the rule of 10. If we can be 10 times cheaper or 10 times better or have a revolutionary or transformative effect on, on the field, then we'll probably do it. So we're usually a little further away from the for-profit, non-profit line than some projects are. When we start a project, it has to have three exit options projected on how we will no longer be doing this project in five or 10 years. And one of the exit options is usually a for-profit spin-off of some kind. So we sold our first social enterprise. We spun off one as a for-profit. We spun off one as a non-profit. We've had one failure of a project that got out of our incubation process and then had to get shut down. And we're in the process of spinning off another one as an open source independent project the community is taking over. So we're always looking at these sort of options. Um, the impact investing field uh, isn't well suited to a software company model. Um, uh, it's really well suited for like microcredit, low income housing, investing in small for profits in the developing world that are likely to be financially successful. Those are great impact investing zones. Um, but when impact investors come to me and say, what kind of impact investing deal you have, I say, well, if you give me $3 million, at the end of three years, I'll have a million dollar year break even business. And they'll say, well, what about paying back the, the $3 million? And I'll say, well, not so much. <laughs> and so, because um, that's actually, when we have that kind of 10 times kind of return, often it has that kind of profile. Um, if, it's, if it's close to there, um, we're actually looking at starting some for-profit affiliates that actually can take impact investing. We have one project idea that looks like that. Um, and it's going to be a more predictable revenue model, kind of more of a consulting revenue model, where we think we will make a steady amount of money and enable us to service the debt or pay a dividend to these, to these funders. So um, we are always looking at what that means. But often, the, uh, when we start them, they're not that good. And then some of them will get to the point where they're actually good, and then we probably transition them to being a for-profit. We, we expect to do more of that. So, OK, so yeah. Could you talk a little bit about opportunities in an enterprise like yours for non 
uh, technical people? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Benetech is, um, the majority of our people aren't software developers. I mean, I think I said we have about eight developers out of 80 people. Um, and so, and, and the kind of jobs that we have are a lot like the jobs that you would have at tech companies with some specific additional ones. So, you know, we have a business development department and they do a lot of the things that a for-profit business development department does, but we're a nonprofit. So they're looking for partnerships. They're looking for making business plans that they might, you know, raise money on that. They're looking for grant proposals. Uh, so those tend to be people who come out of business school. So, um, you know, a couple of them are, are MBAs from the Bay Area. Um, uh, we, uh, our human rights team, um, the human rights field is, is made up of people who are sort of on a more of a generally liberal arts track or lawyers. And so, um, you know, one of our very successful people came fresh out of her Stanford undergraduate, came directly into our human rights program, worked there for five years, worked up to being a project manager, and now is completing a graduate degree. I think, I think she's getting a master's in public health. But often people come to us as undergrads leave to go do grad student work. And we, we've, I'd say at least half the people who come to us in their 20s end up leaving us to go on to graduate school as their next stage. Um, you know, volunteer management, product management, customer service, um, technical support, QA, IT. I mean, it's, it's kind of like the Silicon Valley jobs. And your day-to-day -day job looks a lot like what it would be at a regular tech company. But, you know, instead of talking to um, lawyers or other tech people, you're talking to teachers or human rights activists or volunteers. So. One last question. Mm -hmm. Cool. Counting down, your last chance. Or I'll work into a grand finale. So, well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your interest in social entrepreneurship. I think that you have already seen a variety of different ways to tackle social problems. I think the common one among the social entrepreneurs is rather than looking at the people that we want to help as the recipients of charity, as sort of the recipients of beneficence, we look at them as our partner in social change. They might be our customers. They might be our users. Um, they may be the people that we employ to get our work done. There are probably more people working for Benetech outside of Benetech than for Benetech because we have all these book scanning jobs that we do with social enterprises in, in Africa and Asia. So there's this, there's this whole different attitude about seeing business-like processes, user-driven processes to actually engage in social change. Because you know, our experience with people who are disadvantaged is they're very sophisticated, they work their butts off, and what they lack is access to education, access to health, access to, to, to clean water, access to uh, economic opportunities. And I think if you actually look at the commonality of, of social entrepreneurs, they're all trying to tackle that issue of that lack of access to, as opposed to trying to fix the disadvantaged person, which I think is the, the quite unsophisticated vision of a lot of foreign aid and a lot of traditional charity. Now, that's not to say that we don't need charity. If you've just been hit by a tsunami or a tornado or a hurricane, you need, you need charity. If you had a famine, you need food. But then there's something else. And I think the social entrepreneurs take that, that more sophisticated look. They have sort of the brain of a business person and the heart of a social activist. And they're trying to balance those two. And hopefully, I've given you one perspective of how um, a really geeky, nerdly guy who was trying to figure out what he could do as a, as a geek found a way to blend my love for technology with my love for humanity. And there's so much more that needs to be done. So I hope you guys engage in it and go off and do a lot more of these things that are just sitting around waiting for your attention. So go forth and conquer for good. <laughs> <laughs>